Great. So um, welcome all to uh, today's uh, Synapse lecture, which is going to be um, uh, carried out by Professor Carding from the Quadrum Institute uh, in, uh, in the University of East Anglia. The title will be Gut Microbes, the Next Frontier for Dementia Treatment, Hype or Hope. Um, and I think uh, what I'm hoping that everyone gets out of this talk is the, um, I suppose, the overlap between diseases of the aging and the elderly with neurodevelopment, um, and especially in the field of microbiome. So it's a very exciting talk. Just to give a, a, a background to Professor Carding, um, he is head of gut microbes and health research program at Quadrum Institute in Norwich, and also a professor in mucosal immu immunology at Norwich uh, Medical School at the UEA. Um, he's worked all over the world, particularly in America, where he was at Yale University and at the, and at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and in terms of his current work, uh, which he's conducting at Quadrum, the focus of his re research group is understanding how microbes communicate with their host and the role that the bacteria generated microvesicles play in the crosstalk and how that influences host cell physiology to establish and maintain physical and mental health. Um, he's also conducting a really interesting trial, which I'm I'm really excited to, to, to see um, the results for, which is a phase 2B clinical trial called Restore Me, which is investigating the efficacy of fecal micro microbiota transplantation as a treatment for, for ME, chronic fatigue, which will begin in 2020. And as I'm hoping we're going to understand today, the overlap between chronic fatigue and uh, neuro ne neurodevelopmental disorders generally, including autism, is it, for some types of it is quite profound. So I'm very interested to see those results. But I'll hand you over to Professor Carding and many thanks for, for agreeing to talk to us. OK, thank you, Ben. Uh, welcome, everybody. So um, as Ben said, I'm going to be talking about gut microbes and how they can interact and interface with uh, the brain to affect sort of as well as behaviour. So just for those of you not familiar with the Quadrum Institute, as a picture here of it. Um, we moved in in April 2019. So we've been in the building for uh, just over a year now. And the name originates from the four investors and the four co-founders, the Quadrum Institute Bioscience, North Norwich University Hospital, the UEA, and the BBSRC, which is a UK funding um, agency, which provided most of the funds. So it's a unique building in that it uh, cohabits both fundamental research on the top two floors. We have a clinical research facility that is part of the hospital and UEA, and also we have the North Norwich endoscopy facility in the basement. And the, the remit or mission of the Institute um, is to explore how food and the gut microbiota are linked to promoting lifelong health and also important in preventing age-associated diseases. So if I move on. So the, in terms of the research that we do in the Quadrum Institute of Biosciences, it covers everything from fundamental through to translational microbiome research. And this slide just illustrates the breadth and scope of this. So we're interested in identifying what the constituents are of the the microbiome, the human microbiome. We're interested in looking at its functionality using a variety of approaches that rely on sequencing as well as non-sequencing approaches. And as Ben intimated, we're also very interested in how this impacts on the host using a variety of in vitro and in vivo systems. And then we're relying increasingly more on systems biology and bioinformatics to integrate very large data sets, particularly from sequencing data. Uh, and we're using computational modeling as well to, to, to generate hypotheses um, that we can then test experimentally. And we are doing translational studies, as Ben also mentioned. Um, we have studies that I'll talk about, particularly motion study, uh, which is in later life and dementia. And then we have a, another study called PEARL, which is looking at the development of the microbiome in newborn infants and during pregnancy. And then we're also undertaking various interventional studies, including FMT. So as Ben said, my, my research interests are based around two fundamental questions. How do gut microbes promote health or disease? And how can gut microbes be manipulated to maintain, improve or restore 
health, both physical and mental. So in my talk, uh, I'll just very briefly introduce dementia. I'll talk about the gut microbiome because I'm aware that some of you, um, this is new to some of you. Then I'll talk about some evidence that links gut microbes to health and disease, and then move on to microbes and dementia. And then uh, talk about the gaps, the limitations of studies today, and how we can design better studies. And that brings me then to the Quadrum Institute motion study. And then I'll finish off by talking very briefly about bacteria therapy and how that may be useful. So I'm sure many of you are aware of a lot of um, interest in the general media um, in terms of the link of gut microbes to the brain, in particular dementia. And I've just highlighted here some headlines from um, newspapers as well as scientific magazines and various other sources. Um, so there's clearly this is a very topical area of interest. Uh, in terms of um, its impact on um, health and well-being in the UK, dementia and Alzheimer's disease is the leading cause of death in the UK. And unlike the other causes listed here, the incidence is increasing, whereas for the others it is decreasing. And also, dementia is the only condition in the top 10 causes of death for which we do not have a treatment to prevent, cure or slow its progression. So it is becoming an increasing um, area of interest from both um, social and economic perspective and from the NHS perspective. And East Anglia is considered to be a dementia hotspot. So since the 2013 uh, census, we've noticed there's a significant increase, a very large increase in cases in the 65 to 74 year old age group, and in particular in the, those aged 75 years and older. And by 2025, it's predicted that we will have 10% of the cases nationally uh, attributed to those in our region. And this translates to around about a million dementia patients. And so what do we know about the risk factors for developing dementia? They can be divided into um, those that are potentially modifiable, those, those that are non-modifiable. So those that are modifiable relate to lifestyle and behavior, unsurprisingly, smoking, physical inactivity, obesity and diabetes. And the non-modifiable ones uh, relate to sort of genetics and potentially the microbiome could be considered another host factor which may be modifiable to improve the outcomes of dementia. So genetics and the microbiome are the focal point of dementia research. And in terms of genetics, the APOE4 gene is one of the most important known disease risk alleles for dementia. Um, it's produced in the liver and in the brain, and it mediates lipid transport. There are numerous gene variants that have been described, of which the, there are three that have been the best characterized, the E2, E3, and E4, with the E4 being of particular interest as it's linked to neurotoxicity. And expression of the E4 allele is associated with uh, increased risk of developing um, dementia, particularly at a younger age. So the E4 homozygote alleles results in a 12-fold increase, which significantly lowers the incidence, as shown in the graph, of the onset of dementia. So the etiology of APOE4 that's associated with cognitive decline has been linked to various pathophysiological features, including increased uh, inflammation in the brain, nitric oxide production, increased accelerated production of beta amyloid deposition in the brain, and associated um, neurofibular tangles as well. And this is linked to oxidative stress and neuronal repair. And so a question that we've been attempting to answer is what is the role of gut microbes in disease etiology in at-risk uh, individuals, genetically at-risk individuals. So this is a very busy slide, but it basically summarizes a PhD project which is coming to its end now that was developed in collaboration with Michael Hornberger um, in the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital in UEA. And the aim was to investigate intestinal microbiome changes in healthy individuals that, would, that have different APOE genotypes. So low risk and high risk, and you can see there at top left, we have 
around about 40 individuals that, that stratified into low and high risk. They've been subjected to a battery of cognition behavioral tests. We've monitored their diet. Some have received um, cardiovascular risk assessments and MRI brain scans. Uh, we've also been uh, asking them to complete food diaries. And we've been extracting DNA from stool samples at baseline, six months and 12 month follow ups. And the DNA has been then subjected to um, next generation sequencing to look at the essentially the metagenome, look at all the different populations of gut microbes that exist in these individuals. So at the moment, we've completed the analysis from the cognitive behavioral tests, and that's shown in the middle panel, lower middle panel. Um, there are some the significant differences relate to spatial navigation, which is probably not too surprising. As yet, uh, we still have to complete the microbiome metagenome analysis. Um, and this is planned to be completed within the next two to three months. So we're hoping that this study will provide benchmark data for um, undertaking more longer term um, population based studies in healthy individuals. In particular, to look at the the timeline of changes in gut microbes with um, cognitive decline. And this study provides the basis for our motion study, uh, which I will talk about later. So the human microbiome. Um, this slide sort of summarizes some of the sort of gross features of the microbiome. Um, so every surface of the body and a lot of internal surfaces that have exposed to the external environment contain populations of microbes. Collectively, there are probably more bacterial cells that reside in and on our body than we have human cells. Um, the largest population by far is found in the gastrointestinal tract, has a total mass of around 0.2 kilograms, containing four times 10 to 13 or more bacteria. And the genomes of all these bacteria account for about 99% of the DNA that we carry around with us. So we are, from a genomics perspective, probably more microbial than we are human. And the microbiome has often been called the second human genome because of that, or the forgotten organ. It's complex, it's not just bacteria. I mean, most of the studies to date have focused on the bacterial component, but it is just one component. And in fact, the human microbiome, if we can include the food that we eat and the plant material that we consume, it does contain all kingdoms of life. So archaea, fungi, protozoa, viruses, and food. We know the most about the human gut microbiome. Most studies tend to focus on the gut microbiome, in particular stool samples, which are a surrogate of the populations that reside in the gut. And as I said, bacteria are the primary focus. And we know that the prokaryome, which is the bacterial component, consists of anywhere up to 1,500 or 2,000 bacterial species, 10 to the 14 bacterial cells per gram of content. And of these, we estimate we may be able to culture between 30 and 90 percent of them. So we can culture most, but certainly not all of the bacteria that reside in the gut microbiome. However, they are not the predominant microbes in the gut. Viruses far outnumber bacteria, particularly the viruses that can infect bacteria, called bacteriophages. And then fungi, protozoa, and archaea are present in much lower amounts. So viruses are by far the prominent constituent of our gut microbiomes. Each of us has a core microbiota. That's independent of our race, age, where we live. And they comprise about 50 species in virtually all of us. And there are two dominant phyla, and these are the Bacteroidetes and the Firmicutes. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, this core microbiome encodes important functions, complementary functions to, to us. And in particular, their contribution to the degradation of complex plant-based carbohydrates, the synthesis of essential fatty acids, and they are a source of essential micronutrients, including vitamins. So they perform core essential functions to keep us healthy. Beyond that, we know that the microbiota can distinguish virtually all of us as individuals, which has led to this sort of microbial fingerprint analogy. Each of us has a unique microbiota. 
The principal role of the microbes in all of us is, as I said before, in digestion. Um, the microbes that inhabit the gut can be considered as bioreactors. And the microbes, this process of digesting food begins in the oral cavity, which has its own unique population of microbes. And in fact, the oral cavity may provide the continual top up of microbes and bacterial populations in the lower regions of the GI tract, in particular the colon. So the plants that from the diet that we consume, simple sugars are absorbed in the small bowel. They get directly into the bloodstream. The more complex sugars require fermentation and processing in the colon. And a principal product of this metabolism are short chain fatty acids. And short chain fatty acids provide anywhere from five to 15 percent of our daily energy needs. And what is interesting is that our genomes only contain around 20 genes that allow us to come to break down these complex sugars, so sugar hydrolases. Whereas the genome of one gut bacteria, remember they're up to maybe 2000 different species, one of these species can contain 260 genes to process um, these complex sugars. So that's an example of the complementation and the essential nature of our microbiome. In terms of where the microbiome comes from, um, the consensus view is that it's postpartum, immediately after birth. There is a debate about whether or not um, during pregnancy, the um, developing infant is exposed to um, maternal sources of microbes. And that's part of the study that we're undertaking in the PEARL study, the pregnancy and early life study. We're looking at the origins of microbes that colonize the newborn. Um, so colonization starts initially at birth. The microbes that populate the infant will depend on the place of birth. Is it in a hospital or in the home setting? There'll be different population microbes. The route of delivery is also important, vaginal versus cesarean, as different microbes will populate you know, the infant from both of those modes. And then um, nutrition is also important, breast milk versus formula that shapes the initial colonizers and development of the microbiome. And then the introduction of solid foods is another stage at which the microbiome undergoes shifts and changes. But by about six or seven years of age, the microbiome is pretty much established and persists then throughout adult life. And then at the later stage of life, there is a progressive decrease in the diversity and numbers and types of microbes that reside in the gut which occurs in parallel with and may be directly linked to senescence of various organ systems, in particular the immune system. Some of the things that can impact on changes in the microbiome at any time point in the life course are antibiotics and gut infections. And from a lot of studies that have been done on large populations of individuals, particularly those in Belgium and Holland, we now have a, some idea about some of the variables that can cause the variation in microbiome between individuals. And these charts here uh, show in rank order the influence or the major covariates that influence an individual's microbiota. So right at the top is stool consistency, which um, is the Bristol stool scale. That surprisingly a very simple and straightforward method is probably the most strongest indicator of the types of microbes and the general health of the microbiome. Um, but the others are related to some blood uh, properties, um, morphometric analysis, age, gender, antibiotics, types of food that are consumed, obviously, as well. Um, so you can see some of those things are would sort of be expected and predicted to have an impact. But collectively, all of these covariates can only account for less than 17% of the individual variation in microbiome. So there's a huge proportion of this variability that we cannot explain as yet, and presumably is related to the intrinsic properties of microbes and com complex communities of microbes in the gut, which influences which ones predominate versus those that um, become much uh, a smaller proportion of the microbiome. So as I said, drugs and antibiotics have a particularly drastic effect on the microbiome. And this cartoon illustrates the drugs that are being used to treat uh, C. difficile infection. Um, the cartoon 
illustrates the sort of collateral damage that the use of these drugs can have on the microbiome as a whole. It reduces the diversity extensively. Depending on the dosing regimen, it can take months or years for the microbiome to fully recover um, to a state prior to the infection. And this, of course, can leave individuals at risk from uh, other infections. The other side of this is that the microbiota can treat drugs just in the same way as it treats um, dietary components. It can metabolize them. Depending on how and which microbes metabolize the drugs, this can make them more effective. For an example, there is metronidazole, which is administered as a prodrug and relies on the microbiota processing to make it an active drug. However, the, the microbiota can also make drugs toxic, uh, generate toxic products. So acetaminophen is an example. And there are drugs and there, there are microbiomes which can affect the efficacy of drugs. And that extent of, um, of that interaction depends on an individual's microbiome. And I'll give a couple of examples of this now. The first of which is the impact the microbiome has on the efficacy of cancer therapy, immunotherapy, called PD-1 immunotherapy. And we know that cancer patients can be stratified into responders and non-responders to this immunotherapy. And this is related to differences in an individual's microbiome. So high responders have particularly increased abundance of certain types of bacteria, as illustrated here, whereas poor responders have increased abundance of different types of bacteria. And the cartoon on the left shows that the transplantation of microbiota from responders and non-responder patients into mice that have tumors uh, results in different effects depending on the origin of the FMT. The FMT coming from responder patients, the mice are able to mount much more effective anti-tumor responses. Whereas FMT coming from a non-responder, the mice are less able to um, react to and respond to the tumor. So this is sort of direct evidence that gut microbes can influence uh, the, this type of immunotherapy and that the microbiome profile is therefore going to be increasingly important in identifying patients that, to re that receive the appropriate uh, therapies and anti-cancer therapies. Regarding the mechanisms of this, there are still some significant questions to be addressed as we don't yet understand the mechanisms of this effect and whether or not it's restricted to one or more cancer type uh, and is it also applicable to other types of immunotherapy and then the population patient population is also a factor here as i said because that can influence the makeup of an individual's microbiota so demographics lifestyle behavior could also influence whether or not individuals respond to particular drugs through their microbiomes this is an example of how a drug can modify the microbiota to improve clinical outcomes. This is metformin, which is used to treat type 2 diabetes. And metformin's efficacy is in part attributed to its effects on the, the gut microbiome. And the figure on the left shows that the growth of certain bacteria is promoted upon exposure to metformin. And also the functional profile of the microbiota also changed in response to the drug. This ultimately results in improve, improved glucose tolerance in, in uh, animals at least. So the drug could actually be acting in patients in the same way to promote the growth and outgrowth and activity of microbes which are able to then influence glucose metabolism uh, in the patients. So in terms of the associations of gut microbes to human disease, there have been lots of studies undertaken to demonstrate associations, uh, and that's shown on this slide here. Those that affect a variety of organ systems and drugs, and then the ones in red indicate those that are related to the brain and disorders of the brain. It's not surprising because um, going back in history, Hippocrates said that all diseases begin in the gut. And later on, the gut is a source of irritation that causes inflammation in most diseases. And then Eli Meshnikov, the father of probiotic therapy, said death begins in the colon. So although we sort of realized this perhaps from medicine for a long, long time, it's only becoming clear that this may be uh, true now at the level of an influence at the level of the gut microbiota. So in terms of investigating the role of the gut microbiota in health as well as disease, 
there are five key questions that need to be considered in order to determine whether or not these changes or in gut microbes are causal or just associative and effect of the disorder. And the key one there is number two, as I've said, you know, are the changes in gut micropopulation the cause or consequence of the disease? The best evidence we have comes from uh, microbiota transplant studies. These were carried out um, <coughs> about five or six years ago now by a group in St. Louis, the USA. And what they did is they took uh, microbiota from, an, from uh, twins, one that had a, well, was obese, another was lean transferred these into recipient mice and then observed the effects of this. And what they've shown is that the microbiota that came from the obese twin resulted in increased body weight and body fat in the recipient animals. And these animals that became clinically obese. Whereas the mice that received the microbiota transplant from a lean twin stayed lean on the same diet. And so this has been shown to be attributable to shifts or imbalances in different microbes that are transferred from the obese versus the lean twin, which in turn is linked to the efficiency of energy harvest. So the microbes coming from the obese twin are much more efficient at extracting calories from the diet, and the calories that um, are in excess of the daily needs accumulate um, as body fat leading to adiposity whereas the microbes coming with lean twin are less efficient at extracting energy from the diet, not resulting in, in obesity. So central to these studies are germ-free animals. So these are mice that are born sterile. They have no microbes in or on their body. And so they're perfect vesicles, vessels, sorry, vessels for receiving microbes from a variety of sources to look at the impact of single microbes, mixtures of microbes, very complex microbes on various aspects of host physiology. So germ-free animals um, have been around for about 60 years as an experimental tool, but it's only with the recent interest in microbiome studies that's been a renewed interest in using these as an animal model to look at microbiome-host interactions. So germ-free animals um, have expected or anticipated to have significant nutritional deficiencies, particularly in uh, vitamins. Their diet has to be supplemented with vitamins to keep them alive, basically. They exhibit poor growth, but interestingly, they um, live longer than animals that are populated with microbes. They have defective barriers, both in the gut and in the brain. Their immune system is poorly developed, making them uh, very susceptible to infection, which can often be fatal in these animals. <clears throat> and interesting, they have altered brain development as well. And that's illustrated on this slide. So there are deficiencies or defects in myelination. Microglia are affected as well. Um, the blood brain barrier is had demonstrates in, increased permeability. And neurogenesis is also altered. And a particularly interesting feature is dendrite growth, looking at the length of spine density of dendrites in the brain. And that's shown here on this slide, looking, comparing those from a control animal that is populated with microbes versus those from a germ-free. Clearly see quite striking differences in this. And this is associated with significant change in behavior as well in germ-free animals. So then how do gut microbes communicate with the brain to affect behavior? And this uh, brings in the gut-brain axis, which is the connectivity, that, which is direct or indirectly from the gut to the brain and vice versa. It is bidirectional, and it involves various communication pathways. And the gut is in fact a, a multi-sensory organ. It contains components of the nervous system, the hormonal system, and the immune system, each of which can sense the presence of various stimulants. <coughs> or factors that are in the gut and communicate this as either a threat or a non-threat to the brain to produce the appropriate behavior or response to those. So with regard to the nervous system, um, the, the, the enteric nervous system can produce um, virtually every known neurotransmitter and it consists of around about 500 million neurons. The gut is a source of about 95% of serotonin, uh, which is a major 
um, <clears throat> neurotransmitter that affects mood, memory, sleep, and cognition. And it also produces about 50% of all dopamine in the body, which is associated with reward, pleasure, and motor function. It also consists of a vast array of hormone producing cells that make up the enterendocrine system. Some of them are listed on here. There may be as many as 30 different types, each one being distinguished by the product that it produces. And so it contains a vast array of hormones which can then act to induce all sorts of responses uh, throughout the body. But interestingly, we now know that gut microbes themselves can contribute to the production of neurotransmitters and hormones themselves. And this table illustrates some of the compounds that various gut microbes can produce. And what's particularly interesting is, is that this is not a complex pathway of enzymatic reactions. It's a one enzymatic step by which bacteria can take an amino acid and modify it to produce a neurotransmitter or a hormone. So in considering um, nervous and hormonal input into the behavior, uh, we need to increasingly be aware of the microbes in the gut which can contribute to this uh, production. Now moving on to gut microbe brain axis and dementia, <coughs> we've known for quite a long time now that intestinal microbi dysbiosis is often associated or correlated with impaired cognitive functioning. And this can result in um, object recognition, working memory defects, changes in particular key receptors. As I've shown you, um, presence of specific microbes themselves can contribute to imbalances in neurotransmitter production, but also the metabolites they produce as part of their normal metabolism can also influence the blood-brain barrier integrity. And in particular, propionate seem to be particularly important in <coughs> improving the barrier function of endothelial cells in the blood-brain barrier. And then contrary to this, there are certain types of bacteria that we know can synthesize proteins called curly fibers, and that's shown on that picture on the upper right, that are functionally similar to amyloid proteins. And these can generate immune responses which become cross-reactive to host-derived amyloid proteins. The bacteria produce these because it's important in establishing biofilms, <clears throat> enables them to invade host cells, and it contributes to adhesion. So there is theory that the production of these curly fibers in the gut can allow them under certain conditions to access the nervous system or the bloodstream, enabling them to access the brain. And as I said, immune cross-reactivity to curly fibers and host amyloid proteins has been demonstrated in mice. So looking at this in a little bit more detail, <clears throat> for Alzheimer's disease, most of the studies on the gut-brain axis have uh, come from animal studies, particularly mice that overexpress key proteins, amyloid proteins. And these animals uh, demonstrate increased permeability both in the intestinal and blood-brain barrier. And it's associated with changes or shifts in different bacteria, as indicated on this slide. Um, there have, by comparison, been very few studies in humans, and the ones that have been undertaken have relied on small, small cohorts. But again, <clears throat> some of the changes seen in the mouse models are reflecting some of the studies in humans. However, it's fair to say that um, there's a considerable amount of hype, if you like, with associating these primarily animal studies into human studies. And as you see, some of the uh, things I've highlighted there on the right-hand side sort of reflect this um, over-interpretation, if you like, of some of these studies that have been carried out. But this has led to an interest in whether or not uh, there are bacteria in the brains of uh, um, Alzheimer's patients, whether or not this might be a contributing factor to the pathophysiology of the disease. And so this slide just illustrates a study that's been carried out on formaldehyde-fixed um, sections of the brain from Alzheimer patients as controls, and then using uh, 16S-based sequencing to identify <coughs> bacteria that are present in these samples. And the graphs on the right um, show some of these results, and perhaps the most interesting one is that, that in panel B, where there seems to be a particular um, high levels of expression of genes that are related to actinobacteria, propionobacteriaceae in particular, 
Trypanobacteria acnes, which is often associated with the skin commensal and is linked to acne, as well as the name suggests. <coughs> However, there are issues that need to be addressed in interpreting this data, in particular because of the possible presence of P. acnes resulting from skin contamination. Could this be reflective of postmortem contamination or blood contamination with some of the other bacteria? <clears throat> and the method of analysis or identification of bacteria uh, can be um, susceptible to various biases in the methodology. And again, there's no data here that would indicate whether or not this is causal or not in the disease. Perhaps a little bit more compelling is looking at fungi in the brain. And the images at the bottom show some very interesting pictures of Candida glabrata, which is a yeast. And you can see that it's a hyphenated yeast, so these are growing yeast. It'd be very difficult to, at least, at least consider that these are due to um, postmortem contamination, as um, that would be usually associated with, with, with spores rather than these, these vegetative cells. So this is something I think that may be worth following up. And then there, are, of course, there are numerous viruses and virus infections which have been linked to Alzheimer's disease as well, as shown in the upper right. As for Parkinson's disease, um, there's probably been more studies being done on this than Alzheimer's disease, fair to say. Um, Parkinson's disease is usually associated with early GI symptoms. Um, there are alpha synuclein pathology in the enteric nervous system, and it's, it's hypothesized that um, alpha synuclein could, the protein that's associated with the pathology in the brain, uh, may be able to um, travel up the vagal nerve from the gut if there's a gut source of this. And if the vagus nerve is, is cut, then this can have a protective effect for Parkinson's disease. So there is a potential role <coughs> for the gut in Parkinson's disease. And this has been investigated in an animal model that overexpresses alpha synuclein. And in these animals, there is an accelerated or exaggerated accumulation of alpha synuclein in the brains. Appreciably fewer are seen in germ-free versions of these animals. So animals that don't have any microbes at all, that significantly arrests the development of uh, the disease pathology. And the pathology is, is, as you would expect, associated with increase in various inflammatory markers, particularly the cytokines TNF alpha and R6. And then, interestingly, transfer of microbiota from Parkinson's patients into germ-free transgenic mice accelerates the development of <coughs> some of the pathological features of Parkinson's disease in these animals, suggestive of a direct involvement or contribution of the gut microbes to the pathology in this model. So this has been sort of extrapolated to humans in that there are our patients or individuals may be genetically predisposed or have some predisposing factors to developing Parkinson's in which the microbiota um, can, by influencing on microglial cells, uh, accelerate or cause motor dysfunction pathology. And under germ-free conditions, you don't see this. So again, it's direct evidence for this. And then the the microbiota transplant study I referred to is more of a direct demonstration of a contribution of the microbiota to the development in predisposed individuals. So again, a lot of these studies are based on mice. So how much do the experiments reflect reality? After all, mice are not small humans. So for human studies of Parkinson's disease, there have been relatively few case control studies. And most, it's fair to say, produced inconsistent findings. There's no obvious microbiome disease phenotype. <clears throat> and the box on the right-hand side of the slide just illustrates this variation in that there may be um, shifts in, in patterns of microbes, um, but there's no consistent pattern to this. So what could be the reasons for these? Well, in considering an individual's microbiome is unique. There's obviously the intra or inter subject variability of this that contribute to this. Methodological inconsistencies, the types of <coughs> processes for sample collection, sample transportation, storage, <coughs> extraction, sequence analysis, 
sequencing and sequence analysis, all of these can have an impact or, or introduce a bias to the analysis. So what this illustrates is a real need for standardization of many um, microbiome-based studies that are uh, working with humans. And so that's illustrated on this slide. There's a need for more studies in humans. There are other approaches, but ultimately I think a lot of these studies need to be carried out in humans. And in particular, this requires longitudinal multi-parameter studies to be able to really investigate thoroughly the causality or the association of microbiota changes to human diseases, particularly uh, dementia. And it's not just uh, me saying this, I think um, the NIH in the USA has highlighted this. So what I put on this slide is the funder's perspective on this that arose from a National Institute of Health funding review. And, you can see, and then the researcher's perspective, which has come from the International Human Microbiome Consortia. <coughs> and you know, the priorities for both are very similar and overlapping. Longitudinal functional studies are needed, standardized protocols in particular. So this brings us to the study that we've undertaken, bearing in mind that um, all these factors that need to be incorporated into a study. And the Mosher study um, is undertaken at the Quantum Institute and the chief investigator of this. And the question we're asking is age related decline in cognitive function causally associated with structural and functional changes in the intestinal microbiome? This is an outline of the study. It's a population based longitudinal study carried out over four to five years. What we're doing, we're, we're in the process of recruiting 360 Norfolk participants, age 60 or over. They are assessed, they undergo cognitive assessments through a variety and battery of tests. Based on the outcome of those assessments, they're put into a low, medium or high risk group for developing dementia. And we then collect various samples at regular intervals for them, stool samples, blood samples. Uh, we also look at other lifestyle if, and behavioral changes. They fill in extensive questionnaires so we can assess any changes in, in the way they live and how they live. Uh, we're also doing retinal scans on these individuals, which I'll mention the significance of in a minute. And some get um, structural and functional brain MRI scans as well. And again, a subset of patients, we're able to take colonic biopsies <coughs> from to actually look at um, the structure and distribution of microbes in tissues itself. And the individuals that are helping us with this are illustrated here. So Michael Hornberger is helping us with looking at doing cognitive assessments. Simon Rushbrook is helping us with the endoscopy related aspects. And Ben Burton at James Paget is helping us with the retinopathy. And our recruitment streams. So we're using Norfolk and Suffolk primary and community care. We're using the bowel cancer screening program at the NNUH and the NHS Foundation Trust, uh, particularly to help us recruit the high risk individuals. So the study has been underway now for just over a year. We've recruited a total of about 100 participants. We've suffered significant delays to this because of the COVID-19 situation, but we're now reactivated the recruitment. Um, so we're trying to get back on track with that. This is the sampling schedule. So I said we're taking a variety of tests. Uh, stool samples are collected at six monthly intervals. <coughs> Blood is taken annually. Lifestyle and behavior questionnaires annually as well as if uh, cognitive function. And body morphometry using Tanita scales or something similar. Um, and then we look at the retina at the beginning, midpoint, endpoint biopsies are as and when we can collect them and the brain brain imaging is at the beginning and the end points so the questionnaires that we ask are related to identifying the key covariates that i illustrate on one of the previous slides that may account for or help explain any change we see over time in an individual's microbiome so this is the sort of information that we're interested in collecting and not surprisingly, we're particularly interested in any medications that individuals take or stop taking during the study and significant change in their lifestyle as well. And the Bristol stills chart is something that we are using as well. 
um, to assess uh, their overall indication of gut health and their microbiome. So retinal change in dementia. So we're using OCT and OCTA scanning, which is carried out at the Churchill Memorial Hospital in Beckles. And it's a non-invasive way of detecting change in retinal nerve fibers of ganglia cells. So we're looking at the retinal nerve fiber layer as well as the inner ganglion cell layer. And this is interesting because of some very recent <coughs> findings in that retinal nerve fiber layer thinning has been associated with, or maybe an early indicator of dementia. Um, and that's in a UK study and then an American study as well have highlighted something similar in that structural change in the retina may also be an early flag for Alzheimer's disease. So that's sort of why we're particularly interested in doing the retinal scanning. So then this leads me to uh, bacteria therapy. So we can make, we can do various investigations to look at changing gut microbes, but if you want to change them, what options do we have, particularly for dementia? <coughs> And so this is probably the example of the first attempt to use bacteria to treat mental illness. And this is the turn of uh, the 1900s, uh, an individual called George Porter Phillips, who gave his melancholy patients sour milk with cream and sugar for breakfast, supper for uh, about five to six weeks. And he not only cured their melancholia, he also cured their constipation in 11 out of 18. That's the first recorded successful use of bacteria therapy to treat mental illness. Since then, um, there have been significant advances in understanding gut microbes, which ones are beneficial, and a variety of um, products are now available in supermarkets or health stores which contain probiotic bacteria. And in particular, there's <coughs> one common we use probacteria, which is a lactobacillus, which is associated with um, reducing a state of calmness in some individuals. And we now know this is probably attributable to its ability to produce GABA. As I said on an earlier slide, lots of gut microbes can produce neurotransmitters, lactobacillus, and some strains of lactobacillus that are present in these probiotic formulations are able to produce the gamma amino butyric acid neurotransmitter. And as I'm sure some of you know, GABA receptors are targets for sedatives, benzodiazepines, for example, muscle relaxants and anesthetics. So the consumption of this probiotic <coughs> bacteria is related to maybe inducing a more relaxed state um, in those individuals that consume it. And this has led to a whole new branch of uh, microbiome studies called psychobiotics. Uh, a novel class of psych psychotropic probiotic bacteria here. Yeah. So is this something to be um, taken as seriously or not? And I think the results on this slide, where I've tried to sort of assemble the evidence or summarize the evidence, particularly from a systematic review of trials carried out up to about 2016, indicated that there was very limited evidence for the efficacy of probiotic interventions in improving psychological outcomes. So it's fair to say the jury is still out on whether or not these are effective. But considering the individual nature of the microbiome, these may well be effective in some individuals with a certain type of microbiota, but not in others with a different type of microbiota profile. Prebiotics, another option which can generally be considered as feeding your healthy bacteria, keeping them healthy, um, and is this a better option? So there are certain types of foods which are naturally high in prebiotics, and not surprisingly, these are fruit and vegetables. And really, the advice is that if you consume five portions of fruit and vegetables a day, then you are probably giving insufficient nutrients to keep your health-promoting bacteria in pretty good shape. Even better is to use fermented foods, which are a combination of both prebiotics and probiotics as well. So fermented foods can often be considered as superfoods from that perspective. However, it's quite clear from looking at this slide and national surveys of probiotic, of prebiotic consumption, that very few people are consuming the recommended intake of uh, prebiotics and particularly dietary fiber. 
the main active ingredient in prebiotics. So I think the UK government is even trying to encourage people to take 10 doses of fruit and vegetables or portions of fruit and vegetables a day, which I think is, is far too aspirational. As, I think as many as 60% of the population are struggling to take uh, to consume five portions. So the evidence of the use of prebiotics in Alzheimer's disease, it's pretty thin. There's a mouse study uh, which shows that tryptophan-related dipeptides um, can improve memory function. So tryptophan is an amino acid that can be converted into serotonin. And then there have been some epidemiological studies carried out mainly in Japan, actually, showing that cheese or dairy and milk can help reduce the risk of dementia and lower the prevalence of cognitive impairment. A more drastic approach is the wholesale replacement of a dysbiotic or altered microbiota. And the way that this has been done traditionally is through fecal microbiota transplantation, or FMT. Now, despite a perception this may be relatively new, it is in fact not. It's been around since the fourth century. It's been a part of Chinese medicine since then. First recorded use of it was in the fourth century in, <clears throat> in using a human fecal suspension um, delivered orally to treat diarrhea and food poisoning. 16th century, Chinese physician uh, came up with the yellow dragon soup, which was fermented feces. And this was um, consumed and shown to be effective for treating diarrhea, pain, fever, vomiting and constipation. Veterinarians have been, fair to say, well in advance of medical science in the use of um, FMT in a process that in the veterinary world is called transformation. And I think the picture here illustrates how this is done. <coughs> Direct delivery into the rumen of animals or pump. First recorded use in humans is probably during the Second World War uh, when German soldiers in North Africa consumed fresh camel poop soup to treat their dysentery. And then German physicians identified the active ingredient, which was uh, Bacillus subtilis. And they used this to develop a sort of formulation or medication called Bactisubtil <coughs> to treat the soldiers. And this can still be purchased, still available for purchase now. Uh, particularly in Germany, but also elsewhere in Europe, you can, can buy this product. And then in terms of a medical setting, Stanley Falcao in 1957 was probably the first physician to use the treatment for his patients <coughs> when he encapsulated feces to give uh, post-operatively to his surgical patients. And this was the so-called ASATS trial. And then Ben Eisman in 1958 used fecal enema to cure four near-death patients with pseudomembranous enterocolitis. Since then, uh, various physicians have pioneered the use of FMT, in particular Tom Barodi in Australia, who's used it successfully to treat patients with uh, inflammatory bowel disease and a variety of other diseases, including autoimmune diseases. And during the course of this, um, we've learned more about the optimal route of administration so we've moved away from enemas and now <coughs> we're looking at using colonoscopes to directly administer the FMT to the colon. I guess the big breakthrough in terms of clinical practice came around 2013 when FMT was shown to be highly effective to treat uh, recalcitrancy difficile infection, um, greater than 90% cure rate. And this has now been widely adopted as frontline therapy in UK NHS hospitals as well. So in terms of the future, I think there's increasing interest in the potential use of FMT to treat a variety of human disorders, including those that affect the central nervous system and dementia. And so way into the future, maybe, well, maybe not too far in the future, we might think of this as personalised medicine, which will be the preemptive treatment using a defined cocktail of gut microbes that's tailored to an individual's microbiome and condition to protect them against the development of diseases and to promote lifelong health. And the natural time in the life course to, to introduce this would be in the first five to six years of life when the microbiome is still being established in a young child. It becomes much harder to 
get these microbes to colonize the gut in adults just because of the sheer numbers of microbes present there and the stable ecosystem. So the obvious opportunity there is, is early in life for this. And fecal transplants may help treat clinical depression. So this is an animal-based study along the lines of the obesity FMT trial where stool microbes from patients that were diagnosed with clinical depression were transferred into rats <clears throat> and the rats developed some of the symptoms of depression as highlighted here. Again, providing evidence for a link between gut microbes in particular probably their functional attributes that could impact on mental health. Of course, some questions to be asked here is what impact does diet and medications that the patient received have on their microbiota and are these in fact being transferred over as well to these animals. So in terms of what we're doing at the Quadrum Institute with FMT, we've helped establish a protocol to, for the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital to treat recalcitrant and dipocin infection. Um, we've, treat, we've cured 24 out of 26 patients, that's a not, greater than 90% success rate. And the two failures were due to antibiotic administration um, quite soon after the transplant for non-related illness. So we are currently in the process of constructing our own facility that is compliant with MHRA requirements to use FMT for other interventions. So we're currently in discussions with the MH MHRA to achieve that license. <clears throat> and as Ben said right at the beginning, we, we have a clinical trial that is planned to start actually next year now to use FMT to test the efficacy of FMT in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome myalgic encephalomyelitis and this may well be carried over into looking at um, dementia immunosenescence as well so is brown the future of dementia therapy and with that i'll thank you for your attention i'll be happy to take any questions thank you great well th thank you thank you very much professor carding so um i had some initial questions before i open it up to everyone else but i think i hopefully that talk has shown and revealed the complexity of the microbiome but also um, with the complexity comes from a from a doctor's point of view is the lack of training that you get during medical school and, and and after qualification and the impact that this can potentially have on on your whole system and i think moving forwards this is an area it's almost like a whole new area of medicine that needs to be learned and incorporated into existing curricula and existing practice because as professor carding says the effects of the microbiome are vast. So they not only affect um, the, the, t the different types of bacteria, but also the knock-on effect on metabolism, on drug delivery, um, and on a, a whole host of other disorders. I think the relevance to neurodevelopment for me, um, and this is why I asked Professor Carding to talk, are on the initial stages of brain development. So if you look at the overlap that Professor Carding talked about in terms of the immune system, and the immune system's impact on brain development, that's well documented. And the fact that if you have a dysregulated microbiome early in life, whether that's due to a whole host of different factors, but let's say antibiotics being one of those, can profoundly affect the developing brain through the impact on, on the immune system through things like microglia and the effect of, of, of synaptic plasticity. A lot of this is still, uh, I suppose, unknown on, a, on an individual basis, but I think the, the lab sciences is, is consistently proving now um, the effect on of, of the immune system on, on brain development, particularly in, in disorders such as autism. Um, and I would say moving forward, this is such an exciting area to, to expand and build on. And I think different areas of medicine should come together and not kind of reinvent the wheel. And the work that's already gone on in, in, in with, with Professor Carding with Alzheimer's and ME, there's such a strong overlap with other disorders such as autism and such as other neurodevelopmental problems. Um, I think the other thing to discuss really is, is uh, from an early brain development point of view, is the impact of antibiotics, for example, in these critical windows of neuroplasticity in the, in the first months of life. We give antibiotics quite liberally um, and to completely wipe out a, a, a newborn's uh, microbiome, uh, I think could, can have, have a big impacts. Um, and also the, the infections that children get along the way. And as Professor Carding alluded to, it's trying to understand the effect of infections on microbiome composition. And I think the last thing I wanted to raise is, 
is thinking about the types of children you see in practice. And certainly one of the main things, types of child I see with more severe end autism is of a child who has profound signs of dysbiosis, horrendous smelly poo, big tummy, lots of gas, who are at the more severe end, who are pre-verbal with minimal understanding of language and have this very fluctuant pattern in, in cognition. And you, you kind of have a, an insight into they, there seems to be a connection at some points, but when the bowel symptoms get worse, they go back into the mist. And it's this, the child who doesn't develop alongside this diagnosis of autism. And those, that's the uh, population of children I have seen. Um, and it's trying to understand how much of that is attributed to the bowel. And, and, and again, studies have shown that these children have very restricted gut diversity. There's a high preponderance for certain bacteria, such as um, uh, increased uh, clostridial species, not just C. Diff difficile, but other clostridial species. And the impact of this lack of diversity on the gut permeability, the impact on the immune system, and the, the impact on the, on the developing brain, along with the neurochemistry that Professor Carding mentioned. And I think trying to understand and unpick those questions is really, really important because it will potentially change the way that we view early, early trial development and, and the interventions that we can offer. Um, so it's a really exciting talk and I really hope you enjoyed it. And I now offer the questions open up to, to, the, to the floor. But many thanks, Professor Carding. That was a great talk. Thank you. Thank you.